It's, uh, it's a great honor to be here. I do, I do feel like an interloper. I'm not an economist, but a political economist. I spend most of my time not in the realm of big theoretical ideas, but running a 15-person uh, a policy research institute within a single geographically large but population small jurisdiction. I run the British Columbia office of the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives. Um, and so here's the, uh, let's start with the challenge before us. It's similar to what we've heard. Uh, this from my friend and colleague Bill Reese, who spoke at the INET conference in, in Bretton Woods uh, and the developer of the ecological footprint. But I think it's a quote that captures uh, the puzzle that INET has put to this panel. And I'd like to tackle it, I'm taking a different tack, uh, by sharing our experience in British Columbia, uh, a case study of one jurisdiction in which we are trying to figure out how to bridge this paradox. And I'm going to share the findings of a research alliance that we host uh, called the Climate Justice Project. Um, but f so first off, a little uh, context about our, our little province. Uh, historically, it's a, an export-led staples economy. You probably know us best for forestry. Uh, but increasingly these days, it's natural gas, and much of that now derived by means of hydraulic fracturing or fracking. It's also the province in Canada that's home to the highest income and wealth inequality in the country. For the last 10 years or so, it's been governed by a very neoliberal regime. And yet, curiously, that regime back in 2007 started to get serious about climate change and a year later introduced North America's first carbon tax uh, and then legislated GHG reduction targets. Um, that said, the, car the, the, the carbon tax is certainly modest by European standards. Um, and in clear conflict with these climate goals, the province's economic policy remains firmly focused on expanding the extraction and export of fossil fuels. So enter into this mix our Climate Justice Project, a research and public engagement initiative. Our project has chosen to tackle what we dub the two great inconvenient truths of our time, inequality and global warming. It takes as a given that if our relatively wealthy jurisdiction is to do what we are morally obliged to do within a global context of climate justice, we effectively have to get to carbon zero by mid-century. Consider it the extra insurance we talked about this morning. And so uh, the work of our project is guided by really a single overarching question, which is what is our province going to look like when we achieve that? But to add to the challenge that Eric put to us, how do we do so in a way that reduces inequality and ensures that the societal industrial transitions are just and equitable? Because of course, it could go either way. I think what we are likely to see over the coming few years, as the severity of climate change and weather events become more acute and obvious, and political will uh, and, and public will more focused, is a level and speed of activity and action that we can't quite imagine today. The question will be, will it be soon enough and will it be fair? And my objective here is to outline some of what our project has learned regarding the sources of resistance to transformative change and some of the strategies that we are pursuing to overcome these barriers. And as has been mentioned by others now, the barriers to change are really in the main political and cultural ones or psychosocial ones. The first is that inequality undermines trust that we are all in this together. Many doubt that the task at hand will be undertaken in a manner which is fair and equitable and the effect on public trust is corrosive. There is at play what you might call a, a chump factor. No one wants to feel like they make, make great efforts to reduce their emissions only to have the wealthy buy their way out of change, or that similarly households overall will undertake such actions only to have industry swamp their best efforts. These sentiments are understandable. Take, for example, some of our work looking at GHG emissions by household income. Um, as you can see, the wealth, the, it's very unequal. The wealthiest 20% of Canadians are responsible for almost double the GHG emissions of the poorest quintile, meaning even if the richest 20% reduce their emissions by a third by 2020, which is our legislated target, they would still be emitting more than the poorest quintile are emitting today. And so you can see how this exposes a fairness challenge. The second barrier is the lack of a clear vision. 
We're asking people to embrace dramatic change, and yet the picture of the new life we are asking them to embrace is very fuzzy. So the task really is to bring that picture of a good new life into focus, a life that people can imagine and even desire, and to answer for the public some very basic and entirely reasonable questions about how we will live and work and play and get around and pay for the investments that are needed to get us from here to there. And so issue by issue and sector by sector, our project has sought to answer these questions. Each of the studies we've released to date really is one more building block towards that more coherent vision with reports produced thus far on fair and effective carbon pricing. And let me say this on that one because we've modeled a $200 carbon tax to, per ton carbon tax, which is significant not just as a pricing mechanism to influence consumption and investment, but frankly, we need the money. Uh, we've got a big job to do. And so then we look at how to direct that towards uh, green jobs and industrial strategies, a new vision for transportation and urban design for complete communities, a sustainable low GHG food system, zero emission housing while confronting energy poverty, a dramatic new approach to forestry in the province and emphasizing carbon storage and more is on the way. The third barrier is that individuals can't do this alone. Yet so much of the public education is focused on individual and household actions when in truth, in the absence of structural or systemic changes, households are fairly limited in what they can do. The challenge needs to be recast as a political and collective one, urgent yet feasible, which in turn seeks to bring about core changes to our main industrial industries and infrastructure. The fourth barrier is an economic and political system that is captive to the oil and gas industry. In Canada, the federal government is actively advancing the interests of the oil sands, notwithstanding what this carbon bomb means for climate change. And the dilemma, I think, is this. We need to manage the oil and gas sector for wind down in preparation for the time a few decades from now when we are done with these industries. And yet being managed and wind down are anathema to the profit-seeking sector in general and to this industry in the extreme. The alternative, perhaps, is to break with the presumption that only the private sector can undertake this work. So here is an idea beyond pricing or regulation. In BC, in our province, we're wrestling with this deep contradiction, which is that, on the one hand, we tout natural gas as this clean, green transition fuel and on the other, the sector is burgeoning like the Wild West, increasingly derived by means of shale gas fracking with GHG emissi emissions equivalent to coal. And ironically, much of that gas is destined for the Alberta tar sands. Moreover, and this builds on Ottmeyer's point this morning, because for, uh, for us, much of this comes down to not what we're emitting domestically, but our exports. If BCE if all of the gas that BC purportedly has in untapped reserves were actually burned, the impact on the global carbon budget would be, I would put it to you, immoral. And here you see in this chart, the gas that we sit on, if burned, would be equivalent to almost two years of global emissions. Clearly, in our little province, that's not sustainable. Given this, can the private sector truly be left to manage the natural gas sector as a transition fuel, or would the task be better entrusted to a public enterprise with a sunset clause built right into its terms of reference, focused on the interim on maximizing returns to the public, it is after all a crown resource, and using some of that to finance a just transition plan for energy workers, an idea we've been floating. And the final barrier is that people need hope. Fear-based messages alone can be paralyzing, the answer is not to gloss over the seriousness of the challenge, but rather to engage in what we like to call responsible truth-telling. And so the project has sought to communicate that policy and technological solutions are plentiful and at hand. And we've endeavored to communicate, as I think Carla was pointing out, that the task before us can be accomplished in stages. Just some concluding lessons from our project that we think are, are widely applicable. The first is that climate justice is not merely a plank in a new progressive economic vision, climate justice is the platform. Confronting cl the climate crisis represents a new industrial revolution. 
And what's really needed is to advance an integrated plan, one that ties a needed economic recovery program to a bold climate agenda. Second, I think that that's much of the degrowth debate is a bit of a distraction. I think the challenge is to focus on what matters. Reducing inequality, enhancing well-being, fighting poverty and unemployment, implementing hard caps on GHG emissions that reduce over time, and reducing material throughput, perhaps the result will be slow or even zero GDP growth, and then again, maybe not. The key is that governments should no longer be judged on the basis of the GDP record under their watch, but rather on the basis of how well they accomplish the higher order tasks I just mentioned. For example, if we are truly to rise to the climate challenge, we would expect to see a decline in consumption, a decline in trade, which we can talk about more in discussion, a whole rethink there, but in all likelihood, the task would require a larger, substantially larger role for government and a likely increase in investment, and the net result may well be that GDP remains positive, but where the component parts of GDP are dramatically shifted, and to perhaps state the obvious, that fundamental to achieving that rebalancing is a great deal more redistribution of income, higher taxation, and more regulation and planning. The third key lesson is that the policies have to be seen to be fair. What those GHG emissions per capita tell us is that runaway wealth is associated with runaway emissions. The 1% are a climate problem. And conversely, almost all the climate policies that you can think of taken in isolation have the effect of increasing prices and, and therefore have a regressive distributional impact. That's not a reason not to do it, of course. But it means that redistribution measures both with, within and between states have to be core to climate action. And finally, the public needs to be included in deliberations on the way for, forward in a fulsome democratic conversation because we all have a right to participate in visioning that carbon neutral future. Thanks. <laughs>